All right, welcome back to our house. We have a very special guest with us today. I'm so excited, Miss Nancy Larson. She is also a legend in the biz when it comes to sex and math, but so much more. And we're going to talk about that. And she produces homeschool materials that probably many of you already know of the uh, Saxon K through five, K through four, but also a much requested a science program as well, K through five educator for 30 plus years. So many um, councils, active member of National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, member of National Science Teachers of America. She's very much involved and she taught math all ages, right? Uh, middle school, uh, obviously primary, high school, I believe even graduate level. So she's very experienced here and she's going to give us a lot of great tips and also just talk to us about her journey uh, before Saxon math and after some John Saxon stories I'm hoping we'll get to hear. So all of that. So here she is. Thank you so much, Nancy, for being here with us today. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, as you mentioned, my started as a teacher in public schools, uh, as a person who always wanted to be a teacher. The, my background is in elementary education as well as in mathematics. So I have a dual major from elementary school and so I could teach elementary school as well as uh, middle school and high school math. My experience for graduate work was in special education with a focus on learning disabilities. So trying to figure out while I was teaching what I could do to really help children who had learning dif difficulties and um, a harder time just learning new content. In graduate school, it was in administration and supervision, and it was a six-year degree in that, so I could become a district math coordinator. My first 12 years, I was a high school and middle school math teacher, teaching eighth through 12th grade, and all subjects, ge algebra, geometry, general math, uh, trigonometry, and so forth, all the way up through pre-calc. And then I became, in this district I worked in, the math coordinator of the district. And at that point, I was working with elementary schools primarily, as well as the middle school and high school teachers. But I knew all the people who were working in middle school and high school. They were coworkers and friends. The school was a large district, 30 uh, teachers per grade for K through five. So that was a challenging job, helping teachers teach math. I started, when I first started as coordinator, there was a teacher in the high school who had asked if she could please teach a sac, use a Saxon book. And while I had heard of John Saxon, I had read an article about him, I had never actually had a textbook. She had sent away for one of John's textbooks. And she was teaching Algebra 2 at the time. And this is right after I became coordinator. And she said, you know, Nancy, I would really like to try John's book in my Algebra 2 class. Not having done Algebra 1 or anything at that point with his materials. And I said, you know, we have a book room full of books that don't work. So let's try it. And let's see if this produces a better result with kids. And when I went into her class, so we did that. We also used John in Algebra 2. We used his Algebra 1 and a half at that point, which I'm not sure why he called that. Eventually, it became <laughs> his Algebra 2. Then it, we also used the, his Algebra 1 book in two of the Algebra 1 classes in the high school. It was, and also we tried that in the two middle schools, the Algebra 1 eighth grade classes. We also used his Algebra 1 book that year. The amazing thing for me is when I went into her classroom in November and saw what the kids could do in Algebra 2 compared to what they could do when I was teaching Algebra 2 at the end of the year, it was pretty amazing. And it was like, wow, this is, they're just so comfortable with the algebra. They're just, the methodology really worked. And that 
it worked for the Algebra 1. Now, the other advantage we had is we gave midterm exams and final exams, departmental exams in the high school. And those children that were in the Algebra 2 far, and we always compiled the data and looked at what was the composite score, the average score for all the students. And the students in that class were significantly above what the students were in prior years. So the following year, I decided, well, that would, or the teachers actually suggested, you know, it'd be really helpful if they came in with a better background. So we decided to try the pre-algebra, what was called at that point, John's algebra one half. And I, in, it was about mid-year, I called John, or I called Saxon Publishers at that time, and I called on to the office and said, you know, uh, we're using your program and we would like to, I would like to have data to show if that pre-algebra program really works. What do you suggest we do? Because we're at mid-year, I would like to, pretest the students that are in the current, using the current materials and compare them when they use your materials. So he, and unbeknownst to me, he's the person that answered the phone. So we could, we had a conversation about what we should do. And he suggested I give a midterm exam used from based on the current materials they're using. And we prepared that as well as a test for midway through his program. So we have two sets of data. Then at the end of the year, give a final exam and do the other. Now we had enough students that were actually using in pre-algebra. So we, it wasn't based on one class. It was probably, I think about six or seven classes at least in the pre-algebra between the two middle, middle schools and uh, some of the students in the high school. So at that point, um, so I collected the data and then I was surprised in the spring to get a call from someone who was going, it was from an NCTM meeting. Would you be interested in coming to join us at the NCTM and maybe talk to people about the program if they came by his booth to talk to John. So while well, I was very honored that he would consider that I would go uh, to invite me. And so I brought my book of data and showed teachers um, what we had the, the um, pre-test, the post-test results after we did this for one year. Actually, this was the following year. So after we had used it, I had the test data to show. Um, so that is one year after we were actually using it. But the other thing that happened that first year after we started with the pre-algebra, we got the books and I, said, I realized we really would help if John could explain to, to the teachers how to do this. So I called him up and said, you know, I, I see you're going to be in Long Island on, it was in the fall and maybe October for an, an NCTM meeting, regional meeting. And I'd like to hire you to come up to the district and meet with the teachers and do an in-service. And he said that was not possible. He was gonna die any moment and he did not have time to come up and go any place. So oh, wow. I said, well, you know, it isn't, it, that isn't too hard. You can come up the day before, the day after, it's really close, it's not far. So I wasn't giving up because I was determined, okay, I have, uh, what, uh, about 20 teachers that are using your materials, and I want you to come up and meet with them. I'll pay you. No, no, no. But if he said, if you come down and bring the teachers, I'll take you out to lunch. And I said, all the teachers? 
<laughs> he said, yeah, but I don't think he realized it wasn't a small school. So <laughs> the only way we could do that was to actually get su substitutes for the day. I rented a bus. The teachers, um, we drove down, took the bus to Long Island, met with John. We had a reserve, a banquet room in order to have our actual meeting. And he did an hour and a half in service with us and spoke with the teachers about the program. Wow. Um, the following- You made it happen. <laughs> you made it happen. Yeah. And that, that continued when we, the following year, we decided, well, let's try uh, for the middle school, let's be on the pre-algebra class. I said to the teachers, you pick the book, you pick the class, I'll buy the books for whatever class. And John also had this buy 15, get 15 free. I said, look, you know, let's just try this and see if it works. Well, that worked very well. And some of the teachers said, can you get me books for the rest of the classes? And it just, it really improved the instruction for everyone because we had a consistency across the district and everyone could actually have children be successful. And the way John's books work is if you place children correctly, number one, that's what the parent or a teacher or the district has to do. You have to start them where they need to start based on prior knowledge. Then the students have to be honest and do the work that's required and not copy from someone or say, well, I'm not gonna do my, do the assignment today. You have to actually do the work. And then you have to ask questions as a, as a student. If you do those three things, you can't fail. You, you absolutely learn, it's almost foolproof because of the way John's John and Stephen have written the program. And that's no. what I tried to do for the elementary grades. Can you tell me a little bit, because I don't even remember from my schooling, but what was the math pro, what were they like? What was the curriculum like prior to Saxon? Do you remember what, what made it stick out so much so different, the difference there? Well, the big difference was most texts then and now are still a unit approach where mm -hmm. you have one topic, let's say it's on fractions and you do fractions every day and it becomes progressively harder as you go through and children can't absorb the new steps as quickly. So you need time for practice between. The other thing that I found was by segregating the topics, you didn't have integration. You didn't have the measurement combined with fractions, combined with life experiences so that you didn't have that support and, and constant review and um, application of the math. That, uh, that's one of the biggest pieces by making it incremental and integrated. I think of it as an integrated content in math where you don't separate geometry from measurement, from uh, number fact mastery, from algebra and- right. So everything was very compartmentalized to the point where it was a little bit foreign. You didn't see the connection between it all like that, I would imagine. That is definitely part of it. And the other part is that it takes time for a new step, a new, um, I guess it'd be, you've learned one, uh, um, you've learned, let's take number facts, for example. Mm -hmm. Memorizing a hundred multiplication facts is not easy, yes. but you can make it easy if you build it to so that there's continuous review and a structure to building that. For mm -hmm. example, one thing in the homeschool science, um, math three, for instance, when you're doing, we start by counting, skip counting. How many days are in one week? How many days are in two weeks? How many days are in three weeks? How many days are in four weeks? And we make a counting strip 
and you count up and down. So you count by seven, seven, 14, 21, 20, 28, and so forth. And they become really quick at counting by sevens. Then you can count backwards. Now, when you start multiplying by seven, well, how many days are in one week? How many days are in two weeks? You already know this. Okay, mm -hmm. three weeks is three groups of seven, 21. And that is tying that, that learning or that, that piece that you practiced and introducing a new step. Now you wouldn't introduce all the number of facts at one, one time, you start with the easy ones counting by twos, counting, right. multiplying by two. So yes, that's, that's just a little bit of that. So but then I, Saxon math came on the scene and it was just, wow, that whole incremental development and continuous review, this was a big thing. And you could see the results, right? It was just so apparent right. that then, so then how did you get involved with writing the books for K through four? Let me go back to a minute about yes. um, the other piece was John um, was a person who was very determined to share his methodology with people. And people did not want to listen to what he had to say. They, right. they were opposed to that. They thought... And, and the more he wanted to share, the less they wanted to hear. And it was amazing to me that why wouldn't you consider this? I don't understand it. I really don't get it. I'm hoping you could tell me kind of maybe because you were a teacher, you were there. Why? Yeah. Why was there so much resistance? Well, because John basically told them that they were doing it wrong. <laughs> and they didn't <laughs> want to hear that because they had invested their their lives in teaching this way that okay if you just do some hands-on activities if you just um teach i don't know if you and the books all look the same they're all the same type of thing without integrating and it was i thought for certain people would copy this because it's so brilliant but they right. don't know how hard it is to write this is extremely challenging because you, it's like throwing all the balls up in the air and then trying to catch them all before they, and throw them up again, because you have to integrate everything and you have to absolutely know what, where you're going, what you're teaching, and one person has to write it Yeah, because you can't have different people writing different it's, it doesn't work. It do, so you're happen. accountable in, in a very public way, right? That's part of it too. So meanwhile, after we were doing this and using the Saxon materials, I was working with doing workshops and in-servicing of the 30 teachers I had in K to three. And I would do summer workshops, buy them resource books, make up a outline that was what sort of Saxonizing their program using a basal book. Okay, do this on Monday, do this on Tuesday, do this on Wednesday, and putting together big resource binders. And it was like, I, and I think I did this for like three years. And it was then, then the next year, teachers would change grade levels. It's like, how in the world am I ever going to get this done? How am I ever going to train? And then you get new teachers, okay, can you come in and show me what I should do? Oh, sounds One exhausting. person can't do this. So it pointed, for me, it was, look, I need to find a way of doing this. But John, meanwhile, I'm still doing, doing the workshops, doing the outlines, doing this type of thing. And John said to me one day, um, I need a third grade math program you know, could you write a third grade math program for me? Because he was working backwards in the program. I said, you know, I've never written a math program before, but he said, but you know what they need. And I did because I knew what was hard when I was teaching and what was easy. So I started then, so, so I told him, you know, I'll do this if you let me do K to three, but I need it 
all at the same time. I can't do third, then second, then first, then K, <laughs> because I need something to give the teachers. And only if you let me, you know, as I write the lessons, you, you copy them or send, you know, typeset them and do the worksheets for me. And I'll give them to the teachers and they get to test it out. And I get to work with some of the teachers and, you know, have them involved working with me because I need to make sure this works in the classroom. I don't want to be embarrassed that I'm writing something that doesn't work and because I'm thinking he's never going to publish this because I'm going to write what I need. I'm going to write what the teachers need, what the kids need, what I need. And, you know, but he, I knew the idea behind it. I knew the structure that I needed, but I need to, needed to bring it down to elementary level so that it worked in their everyday life. So how long did that take writing all of that? Um, that was three years of pretty much constant. I was wow. still working while this was happening in my regular job. We had no computers in the school, in the office or anything else. Wow. So I would come home. And fortunately, my mom lived with my husband and me at that point. And my mom, I would call her from work, mom, I'm coming home. She'd have dinner on the table that I'd go upstairs and work. And my husband was very, very understanding and supportive of this. Then during vacation time, during summer vacation, that was, I would have to write 10 lessons and weekends, of course. Um, I would have to write 10 lessons for every week for two, uh, five lessons, let's see, it would be 10 lessons for two grades every week because I'd have to have the lessons for the teachers to teach because it right. was, they were teaching as I was writing. They were using um, it in real time as you were writing it, producing right. it all, wow. Right, and, and sometimes I'd teach classes, teach lessons because that's what part of my job was too as a coordinator. I was in schools all the time. The superintendent said, I, when I asked, well, what do you expect from me? He said, I expect you to be in the schools. So what are you doing if you're in the schools? You have to be in the classrooms and teaching kids and working with, with teachers. And wow. I think that's one of the issues when you have math coordinators who are not in schools or any type of district coordinators because you're out of touch with what's happening in schools. You yes. have to be in the classrooms. And I've Believe me, I've learned so much from teachers that about classroom management, about developmental characteristics of children, what they like, what engages them, what you need to do to just get them excited about learning. So, so how long did this take place after what that you got started after that lunch with John Saxon? Was it kind of right after that or a few years after that? Because he kept saying he was going to die. So I'm just wondering, was there some kind of urgency? Well, no, there was a little time in between that. That I started in, I'm trying to think, I think about 88, 1988. And it was published in 91. But each year I rewrote all the lessons. Oh, the second year he decided, or I asked, could we try this in a few more schools other than with the teachers I'm working with? And actually what happened in the district is I only worked with about six teachers in the grade level at initially. Mm -hmm. And then the other teachers heard about it and said, well, can't we do this? Can't we do this? Okay, okay, I'll ask John if we can, everybody can have it. And he gave it to everybody. Then he, um, so I said, well, it'd be helpful if we had maybe six teachers in different areas, try it out too, the second year. Okay, so I had a right to stay ahead of them as well. And they'd send lessons out to them, but it turned out it wasn't just six teachers, it was like 50 teachers because more people heard about it and wanted to try it. So then I rewrite again and it came out actually in two halves when it was first published because I had to do the final rewrite. That was first edition. Then I did the homeschool version off of that so that it was written for actually 
parents and what you would do at home with your child. Same, you're basically teaching the same content, except that you're doing it in a different format and you have more opportunities to have one-on-one. -on -one so is um, this the, the homeschool one, yes. correct? I have this yes. one, I have a few other ones. So this is the yeah. homeschool and it's readily available. There's kits that come, it comes with the worksheets and you have a little meeting book and all of that, correct? Absolutely, absolutely, yep. So you have the materials you need to actually teach. And if you need any manipulatives that go with it, you can always order them from a hand to mind. I think ETA hand to mind did some of the manipulatives, whether it's pattern blocks or things like that, because it was the idea is to actually have experiences with the math. And actually, Leanne um, Harmon on your team, she gave me this amazing tip. She said, you guys really oh, recommend yes. doing the math wrap up. So I ordered like, right. multiple kits and my kids, I've never tried this in all my years homeschooling and they loved it. It's, it's such a great way to learn their math facts. So that's something you recommend in your program, correct? Absolutely. We use those actually. Um, I've, I've incorporated those in the program as well. So it, those are absolutely a valuable resource for parents and children. They love those. Yes. So when you were writing your material, you were giving it uh, to, your, to different teachers that were trying it out. Did you ever have to deal with any resistance or people fighting you on it that didn't want to try it? Or in your experience, everybody was just welcoming it and wanting to use it. Did you have to have those battles that John Saxon had? No, I, I mean... I didn't, but I, people were looking for something that worked. And the interesting thing, elementary teachers were not resistant. They wanted something where you had all the materials that you needed. They're not math experts. They wanted organized. They wanted, they want a structure because it isn't enough to say teach teach multiplication facts or teach fractions. Um, one of the issues today is some of the common core math where you don't start fractions to later because that's considered, you know, just focus on fewer topics. I'm completely, I have a complete opposite opinion on that is that you start as many topics early as possible. You use vocabulary, you use the, teach the number facts early. And, but you do it in a way that's kid friendly, mm -hmm. that makes them want to learn. So obviously John Saxon, he, he loved your material, right? He published right. it, he produced it. So how did that all come about? Well, he, you know, we talked about, um, he came to visit, he saw the kids in the classroom and he decided he was publishing it. And then uh, homeschool, then I, I did a science four program that we used as well in the district. The, um, I don't think it was ever changed into a homeschool program. The Stevens program was the uh, K to three, uh, K uh, from four on. Mm -hmm. Um, but he was very supportive through the whole program and I love the guy. So did, how was your relationship after that? Did you still keep in touch? Did you do conferences together? What was it like? Oh yeah. When he, he passed away, I believe in 96, I think I'm not quite sure, but, uh, maybe 98, I'm not sure now, but um, we were together often at conferences, uh, doing things together. And that was really, there were great people working there at Saxon Publishers. So I actually have a picture that uh, Stephen Hake sent me. I wanted to sh uh, show it to you. And then if you could tell me what was going on in the picture. Oh, yes. We were at... Uh, a conference, I'm trying, it definitely was a math conference. Uh, John is in the middle there with the tie on, Stevens to his 
right and I'm on the left, on the far right. And that is Frank Wong, who is the co-author of the calculus book with John and, and eventually the president of, of Saxon Publishers before it was sold. Great, great friends and great people. So there. I wanted to ask you how you were declared an expert in education based on uh, results from the national study of what works Clearinghouse and the US Department of Education. So at what point did that happen? Uh, that probably was about 2003, I believe, some time there, 2004. So after um, measuring all your K through four programs, all of that, that right. was based on the results. Right. So it did obviously it, well, very actually well. It was a study about first graders and it compared programs that um, with different first grade programs. Okay. And Saxon was one of the programs based on the results of the study that produced the best results for first graders. So was it John Saxon or was it the parents? Who was it that was requesting and asking you then to develop the science program? The teachers pretty the much teachers. said. And I noticed that in most elementary schools that there, there wasn't much science being taught. And what was taught was usually let's plant seeds, let's do the water cycle, a lot about plants, animals, um, you know, it was the same topics, but teachers didn't have any guidance or had very limited guidance, or the students had books that weren't interesting. And they wanted something that was structured like the math. So how did you Saxonize the science? Well, it's a little different than the, the Saxon program, but it has the same idea that you have to have a structure that, that it, a program that's structured, that gives teachers clear guidance, that has a continuity of content across the program so that you don't just pick and choose things and repeat the same topics. It had to have the life science, physical science, earth and space, all those strands, and it had to have clear objectives of what do you want children to learn, and the development of vocabulary, similar to developing vocabulary and math about what, what do these terms mean, um, hands-on experiences for children. The one difference is, well, I'm not sure it's a difference from John's work and Stephen's work, where they had the reading passages in their books. Well, this actually in, in includes the reading passages and we have booklets that the parent or teacher reads with the children as a shared read to review the content so they can go back into text because we're actually reading nonfiction text. Um, it has the topics are build through the grades and within a grade. So it starts and you don't just jump in, oh, I wanna do um, topic D before I do topic A because all the content builds as they go through the program. So. So the but, incremental development and continual but, review and you're very big on language, right? And communication and just making the kids a part of the world with you, right? All of that makes a absolutely. difference. So. We talked about it a little bit, but in, in your opinion, what is it that truly makes some curriculum more effective than others? Because you've obviously, you've tried so many different things, yeah. you've written different curriculums. What is that key? Is that what it is, that incremental development? Or is it more with the language aspect? What do you think makes a curriculum most effective? I think it's a combination in math or something that's that sequential, whether it's in phonics or in handwriting maybe, or in um, math particularly, that incremental development, incremental integration of content and carefully sequencing the steps. But 
It has to be done with actually trying it out. You can't write that and think that you can, it's going to work unless you've actually tried it and to see what the reaction of the children that are using it is. Because you can tell by if you've introduced it, if you haven't practiced enough before the next step. Mm -hmm. And that increment, incremental approach means that you introduce a little piece, then you continue practicing at that level, then you introduce another piece. But meanwhile, you can introduce a different piece. So if I'm doing a number fact introduction, then I can do something in measurement, let's say uh, measuring to the nearest inch. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about perimeter. Well, we're going to use measuring to the nearest inch when we talk about perimeter and using a ruler, because then they're practicing actually measuring the perimeter of a rectangle to the nearest inch. And we can develop that idea of perimeter, and do you need to measure all the three, the four sides. So I think the incremental is extremely important in math, particularly. Mm -hmm. I think the reading and both John and Stephen's books were written so that people that were good at language can understand them. You don't have to be good at math. You you can read their books and understand what they're writing about. And that's what we've tried to do, or I've tried to do in the science. So that that's one of the comments people have, like they really get it because it's written so that they can understand it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's sentence structure. It's the way we'd have paragraphs designed. It's looking at every word that you actually write and evaluating, is this important? Is this an important word to use? Is this helpful for the meaning um, of the passage? What won't, you can't have un, too many unfamiliar terms in a written passage because it interferes with comprehension. Um, so, so many little micro decisions you have to make no. when you're creating this curriculum. I don't think parents even really understand that just it's truly a labor of love it sounds like absolutely i mean you know you wouldn't realize that a lesson is rewritten maybe 50 times and one of the things that teachers don't have time to do when you're a homeschool parent or a teacher you don't have time to spend researching and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting to make it work you need to have a curriculum that you know has been tested, you know has been developed with children in a real situation and that has everything there for you. Because the goal was, if I wanted teachers to teach math, I had to make it as easy as possible for them to do. That you don't have to bring all the books home at night and study how are you going to integrate this? Because one of the ways I knew which teachers to work with initially in math were the ones that took all the books home on the weekend and tried to write their own lessons wow. initially. But when they were they were struggling to do that. So let's just make something that really works. And but the teachers then said they had a they really enjoyed working on the math program. And in future editions, I had teachers from different parts of the country working with me. <clears throat> I've met homeschool parents. But one of the things they said, well, don't you have another project for us to work on? I said, well, yeah, I, I'm thinking I would really like to write a science program. And they said, well, I don't know anything about science, but sign me up. <laughs> but, but that's what exactly what you need is people that don't necessarily have the background and are willing to, to learn and willing to try and, and work with you. Um, one of the things I did when I started science is I started by looking at the AP exams in chemistry, physics, 
biology, because I wanted to see where do we need to be? What are the big ideas? I looked at, at national standards. I looked at state standards for different states. Everybody has different standards, but you have to come up with some structure that, that will cover all the topics and be age appropriate, um, you know, just work with what you know is what children are like at a certain age. For right. example, children in the primary grade, uh, K and one, like five, six, seven, even into seven, is that I want to tell you something. I'm a, I, it's about me, you know, my world around me and, you know, what I like to do and, uh, they're just, it's that egocentric, I'm, I, I like nature, I like animals, I like plants, I like butterflies, oh, butterflies are really popular, and um, they're very then, curious, very observant, yes. it kind of wanes after the older you get, but right, they're at their peak of curiosity and observation. And then as they move on by second grade, so what we focused on in kindergarten is really in science is development of, of vocabulary and all the strands and presenting things. It's still a perspective on them. If we're talking about animals, let's talk about animals from the perspective of pets. Um, we'll plant seeds. We'll, we'll, we'll look at how marigold seeds grow versus sunflower seeds. We'll look at things that are about them even naming parts of the body, the difference between your chin and your shin um, and, your, and your elbow and things that, yeah. But we, it's with activities, it's with using language. Um, by first, by science one, we talk about a lot about them, about stages of life. That's a big theme through this, looking at the stages of life of human beings, looking at the human body, the study of human body, um, being healthy. The, uh, we look at trees. Now, if we've already planted seeds in kindergarten, we're not gonna exactly do the same thing. Let's talk about trees and the life cycle of trees. So those are right. some of the topics. So I wanted to ask you if you could, and you've given us a lot already, but just advice for homeschooling parents who maybe, you know, because of the pandemic, they've been thrown into this, you know, and they feel, feel ill-equipped, but you dealt with teachers who right. had degrees and they also felt the same maybe level of insecurity or ill-equipped when it came to these issues. So if you could just give maybe uh tips to homeschooling parents on how to choose maybe the curriculum, because that's ultimately going to make a big difference outside of our own, what we feel maybe our, our capabilities. Uh, but what tips would you give homeschooling parents today? I think, first of all, <laughs> um, have a structure yes. and have a daily structure have clear goals of what you want children to learn, your child to learn. Set up, um, just like in classrooms, you have to have a routines. You have to have, be organized. So the more organized you are, the clearer you are about what you want your child to do and a, a structure of what the day is gonna look like that's that's a starting point. Um, then sometimes it's challenging when you have more than one child, you're homeschooling. And I know I've heard from parents that sometimes they choose one level, let's say it's in science to work on with two children because that works as well as works as well as trying to teach two separate sections because you you have limited time. At also, the math, I think, is pretty quick and easy to teach with the introduction because they're working on the problem sets. The, um, I think 
It's also important that the more time you can spend in conversation with your child, watching them, that's one of the pieces that's difficult in a classroom with 20, 25 children. Mm -hmm. Children want to have that contact with you. The more that you are looking at them, conversing with them, asking questions, and you can tell when you when they don't understand something by just watching their face, what, right. what's difficult, what's happening. The other thing is the more experiences they have on going out in the community, going out on trips, going to wherever you can go on vacation that is educational, um, any kind of experiences like that, they're gonna learn from. Yes. It's more true. than what it just happens in your teaching. But I think that idea of having clear goals, what do you want them to learn? What are they going to learn today? And right. that's, that's pretty important. So I was going to ask you, I know we're wrapping up here, but just thinking about your journey and everything, have you ever thought about what if you never picked up the phone and called oh, Saxon Publishing? <laughs> <laughs> what would your life would have been like? Because it just changed so drastically after that. I mean, you, you wrote curriculum, you, you, it's amazing. So do you ever think about that? What if you never picked up the phone and made that call? Uh, you know, I never expected that. Some, I guess I look at it as being, you take opportunities or you, you have to have initiative if you need something. If you mm -hmm. need something, then you go out searching. And I think that's important for homeschool parents too, is to not to reach out to people if you have a need, like I needed that. I needed something. I was searching for something. I, I mean, it was, I spent many years trying to oh, think before school started, okay, what am I doing this year that's a little different than last year? So, I don't think it was out of character for what I would do. Um, it was just that I also know you can't rely on what everybody else is saying about something. You have to actually observe it yourself and you have to make a decision about, is this really, you know, what is, what will, how will this help? What is, what is the value of this? And to me, I mean, it wasn't, I was, when I first started using the Saxon program, it was like, oh my goodness, can I ever tell anybody? What are they going to say? And I was like, <laughs> really? okay, I don't care. I mean, it, but yeah, it was like, you'd go to a meeting and they'd look at you. If you said you use the Saxon book, it's like, oh, what's wrong with her? But, you know, it's oh, like- funny. But you had the goods to back it up. You had the results. Yeah. And so when and you started I, I writing, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just knew it worked. Right. So, so when you started writing the science, uh, was your husband, your mom, everybody like, oh no, here we go again. No, <laughs> they just come no. to peace with this is they, what you were doing. Yeah. They were fine. I mean, I, I have to say my, my husband was very, very supportive of this. He thought this was terrific and was would always bring us lunch when we had meetings or to whatever so <laughs> and he was he was terrific with that and mom was very supportive too so I think when you feel like something you see a need and you want to fill it and you just feel very compelled to do something yes it's a lot of work but in right. a way it can feel sort of effortless because it's just like you were meant to do that kind of work. I know Stephen Haig, he also had th these conversations with Saxon, John Saxon, when he asked, why do you think we were chosen for this? You know, the, you were willing, you wanted to do it. So in a way, maybe it felt a little effortless, but still a lot of work. Would, would you say that's true? It's very rewarding because yes. you think, look, I can help so many people. I can, you know, who, how lucky am I that I have a chance to help people and make their lives easier. And that's what people say, oh, I love this. This is so, you know, the kids are engaged. They really enjoy it. Well, 
that's, a, that's the reward. That's the fun right. part of it. Yes. That when you work really hard at something and it is helping someone, it's very rewarding. So just to wrap up here, do you have any favorite John Saxon memories, something that he said that maybe stuck with you, anything like that? He said, don't tell him the secrets. <laughs> I was like, but and so I would tell people, I, at first when I was writing the number fact, uh, out the, the sequence for the number facts, you know how you practice the different number facts every day on, yes. fact, sheets, on fact sheets and math? Well, I made up this code that I thought, okay, this is kind of a secret code. Nobody, but then I realized nobody ever asked. Nobody ever cared. <laughs> but he had these secrets in the program, like Eddie showed me where they were in his algebra book. Like this is a different way of teaching something, but this really works, but don't tell anybody. So <laughs> there's a book it's yeah. like that. But it it was, and I always thought, well, after we after I do this, obviously someone's just gonna copy the copy the technique. No one but does. Have they? No, no one no, has, right? No one has it is too hard to do. First of all, there's too many things you need to know. You need to know how to sequence. You need to know what the kids are like. You need to write the script. You need to, it, there's, and one person has to do it. That's, that's the challenging part. So, right. I mean, if it was that easy, I guess everybody would do it. Right, exactly. Or maybe they think it's not important to do. You know, well, it just makes so. it stick out even more today than ever. So, hey, <laughs> that's science. one of the unique things. Yeah. It's in, like in science. I think content matters. The current idea is that, oh, they'll just work on projects and activities and STEM activities. Well, the kids don't have an idea why they're doing it and what the learning is. Right. So when I ask, what did you learn when I've spoken to children doing those kinds of activities, not things I've recommended, um, they'll say, um, let me think, we learned how to work together. Now, if you're in fifth grade, and that's your learning objective, that is something for a preschool. You'll learn how to work together and cooperate. Right. But that, that should not be something that is the learning objective of the lesson. Right. So for parents out there, I hope they find this helpful. Think of the results more because so, I think parents, a lot of times we focus on just the methodology, what sounds nice, looks mm -hmm. appealing, looks aesthetically pleasing, what looks nice on the shelf, maybe something they wanted to do um, growing up. But we do have to think about results as well and then work it backwards, just like you did with all the Saxon books, correct? <laughs> It's absolutely, what do you want children to learn? And that's the focus of the lesson, but make it engaging for the children. Right. And one way to do that, like you said, teachers, and you you had to be in the classrooms. And obviously parents already have that advantage because we're with our kids all the time. So that's an advantage there, right? Absolutely. So where can parents find out more about your curriculums, your work? Where do you have a website where you like to send people to? Where can yes, they find we, you? we do have a website. It's nancylarsonscience.com and also Nancy Larson Publishers. Either way, it'll take you to the website. Um, it's um, the math. I think you would have to search for um, something, I think there are people that are selling that. I'm not affiliated directly with the math any longer. That's owned by um, HMH at this point, Har uh, Hope Mifflin Harcourt. Mm -hmm. And um, so that I but just the hope- the science you are, correct? I, I am the owner of the science company. And we have a homeschool, a person helps with homeschool. We're based in Connecticut. 
in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Okay, nice. So what? Well, if you have ahead. any questions, we'd be glad to speak with you. We have someone in the office all the time who handles customer, ser customer service. And we also have a homeschool liaison who has actually done homeschooling with, wow. her, with her grandchild now. Now, are you speaking anywhere anymore? Are you going and doing conferences? Or, I mean, what right now, everything seems to be kind of shut down anyhow. But do you plan on doing that anytime soon? We are going to conferences. Um, um, I'm at some of the conferences and other educational consultants from the, my company work are at conferences as well. And that's where there tend to be the la latest ones we're at are Lutheran conferences. And we also are at Catholic conferences, some public school conferences. And lately there haven't been a lot of conferences for homeschool. I think because of COVID and things like that. But we did at one point have attend those conferences as well. So I'm not speaking at the current time. I have no um, nothing scheduled. Nothing scheduled at this at this point, except to be at uh, some of the some of the conferences. Okay, well, thank you so much. I really You're appreciate welcome. you taking the time and just taking us down Saxon memory lane and just showing parents to the passion, the thought, the work that went behind writing uh, the curriculum that you did, all of it, and tips for parents today. That's really helpful. So I just appreciate it. Thank you so much for being You're with welcome. us today. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me.